Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Fund Your Passion podcast with JBR Capital. And as usual, joining me is my co-host and founder of JBR, Darren Selig. Hey, Darren. Welcome. Welcome again. Well, this is the man who should be welcoming us. Obviously. Obviously, Fund Your Passion. I mean, it doesn't get more passionate than where we are today. We are, of course, at Tom Hartley Juniors. Tom, thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> now it's your chance to welcome us. <laughs> no, thank you. It's uh, it's good to be on this. Uh, it's good to be on your series. Uh, I know you, I've seen a lot of them before, so you do a great job, and uh, it's nice to sit here and chat with you both. Well, Amanda does a great job. I, you know, I she did. carries me along very well. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't really want to say that, Darren, but um, you know, okay, we'll uh, we'll agree. Did you see the what? Have you seen any of them that we've done? Uh, I've seen a few of them before. I've yeah. flicked through them. So yeah, you uh, you you're very you're both very talented. Thank you so much. I'll take that as a it's compliment. A big, fat Thank compliment. you. Thank you. Obviously, the podcast is called Fund Your Passion. Mm. Um, I think it's fair to say your passion started very young. It did. Where did it start? Where did it start? I don't remember it starting actually because it's just, it, it's just uh, it was always there. I've always loved cars. I was brought up around cars. Obviously, my uh, growing up in around my father's business. Um, so cars for me has just been a way of my life. You know, it's just part of my life. Uh, so I am a true petrol head. You are. Darren, this morning, shared some of your young, your, your very early I'm so sorry. petrol <laughs> head. <laughs> I did refer to them when I came yeah, in. Yes, you did. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've watched any of those, but yeah. It's, Would you like to see them? It's okay. <laughs> no, but it's I think okay. it tells a wonderful story, you know, and uh, explains the, the early beginnings <laughs> uh, and your interest in cars from an extremely um, an unusual age, um, actually. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you want to tell us a bit about that. And, about uh, about where it started yeah. uh, well you know I, I i suppose for me going into the car business was a bit like a farmer's son being a farmer i didn't growing up i didn't know anything any different you know i envisaged that i would be a car dealer um uh, and you know being around my father's business yeah. growing up around cars uh, it was just a way of life i would leave school and um, when I'd come home from school, my dad would say to me, I think about this often now actually with my oldest son because he's around the same age. Um, and my dad would say, I bought a car today and you know, how much do you think this is worth? A 1986 Rolls-Royce Silver Spirit, uh, 22,000 miles. And you know, he would always test me on valuations of cars because you know, my son now is obsessed with these computer games. He loves PS5 and playing with all of his friends, which I love. Uh, I, I love for him, yeah. you know, that he enjoys it. But I would always, of an evening time, be looking at car magazines, you know, and going through and um, seeing some fantastic adverts by other dealers, great dealers at the time, uh, and also looking at private cars that were for sale. And, you know, back in it wasn't that long ago, but back in those <laughs> days, in the olden days, um, we didn't have the internet. No. So, We're you know, these days right. now, you're just <laughs> clicking through Instagram. I used to and love getting, you know, the Sunday Times and looking yeah. through the deals. And I've still got the old Sunday have Times. Have you? And, it, and I remember myself being fascinated looking at the price of these the cars. Rolls Royce through Sunday Times. Yeah. 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 I, I, I remember yeah. that was in the, in the little clip this morning. <laughs> With a big chunky mobile phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, no, I've still got, I, I, the, the Sunday Times, I miss that actually, because mm. you'd rush of a Sunday morning to get it and you'd look in the back of the sports exactly. section it was in. And, you know, on the front page was always, you know, Manchester United or Liverpool or, uh, but everyone, well, for me, you just turn straight to the over. back. Yeah. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. So the fact that you were actually having to take this information in, obviously mm. not digitally, as you say, you can't refer just quickly mm. on your phone or a computer yeah. and refer back to it. You were having to read this information. You were therefore having to learn and retain it. In a you very retain it. That's the difference. I was just about to yeah. say, has that taught you a skill set that maybe some of the um, younger dealers? You or know, um, yeah, the one thing that I try and teach everybody here in my business, actually, um, I have some great staff, but it's all about retaining the information, retaining the knowledge. It's okay reading about the history of a car, but if you read about the history of the car and you don't actually retain it, then you actually haven't learned anything. And you need to be able to, you know, I can walk around the showroom and we do our YouTube videos. I don't know if you've ever seen any of them, but on the Tom Talks and I, I, we, I like to do it in one clip 
no brakes and obviously whenever you whenever you do um any video footage it's so easy to make a bit of a slip up or a yeah. little bit of a mistake and you want to do another clip but i think it's nice to do one take so you can just reel off the information of each individual chassis of car and the only way that can happen is if you retain the knowledge or the information when you're procuring that car i have watched some of those and you come across as very authoritative on those cars which i think is exactly what you're saying it come, comes across um, extremely well but Perhaps you know this this um, skill set that you learnt in the the very manual old school way. Uh, does that help you in terms of valuations on um, you know the million pound plus cars? Because every car is mm. even if there's only 36 made, each yeah. car of the 36 is different and potentially valued in different ways. I don't think it's very hard to be able to teach anybody on how to value a car you know, the type of cars that my business specializes in, that we operate in, it's, so much of it is down to gut feeling and experience. So, you know, you can look around and you can look at a Ferrari 275 and, you know, 275s vary from, you know, we sold a car last year that was about 1.4 million pounds, which was a short nose, three carburetor, two cab. And then we've got a 275 here that we just sold recently for three million pounds. And, you know, we would have never been able to have bought that car for the three million pounds level if we would have referred back to the 1.3 million sale. But you have to have enough knowledge in the product to realize and go they're actually different cars. One's a right hand drive four cam, one's a left hand drive two cam with three carburetors. And you, it's, a lot of it comes down to knowledge and gut feeling and thinking how much can we potentially sell that car for? Is it good value? Is that the true market value? And sorry, I was just, sorry about no, no, the go, go. in. Uh, but how, how much of the element of someone's, the price that someone's just willing to pay for the car drives the values? Or are they always looking the other way around at, you know, the things you've talked about that's driving the value into good value, benchmarking, it's different in this way or is it just sometimes people just want the car and they will pay a price for it to, to do, own it? do you know I, I think that um i would answer that i would answer that question in two different ways yeah. you know often i will use the saying something is worth what something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it but what I mean by that is that's the market value. It's okay having all these bedroom brokers, Mickey Mouse car dealers who will say to you, I think I can get you X, Y, Z for your car. That doesn't mean anything. They think they can get you X, Y, Z for it because they just want to market it. They want the PR, the exposure from dealing with that important car. But at the end of the day, that, there's no promises. If, the, if Ukraine and Russia kicks off again and the car goes down in price, you, you know, that, that owner of that car is the one who's going to suffer any possible loss. Mm -hmm. The dealer hasn't got any commitment. So when I say something's worth what someone's willing to pay for it, something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it, meaning that this is the true value of the car today. This is how much we will pay you for it. Um, but I don't really ever get many clients that will just want to buy something because money's no object. Every single one of our clients whether we sell cars for tens of millions of pounds um, or whether we're selling a car for, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand pounds, people want to feel that that is the right value. And I would actually, I'd, I'd go on further to say that the more valuable a car is, the more people want to know it's the true value. You know, the more astute the buyer is. And, you know, if it's the most unrepeatable, greatest car on the planet, Yes, they'll be prepared to pay a premium because you have to buy, a, you have to pay a premium to buy something that's unrepeatable. I pay premiums. I set world records every month in cars that we buy. You know, I went to an auction the other day in Paris, and everyone thought that Jesus Christ, Tom, how much did you pay for that 288 GTO? You know, that's that's well, wow, mate, did you make a mistake there? Like that, that was insane. You know, did you have too many drinks at the auction? And you know, we've sold 288 GTOs for, f you know, far more than that two and three years ago. So it's just knowing the, um, you know, we're prepared to always pay a top figure for a great unrepeatable car, but 
every one of our clients always want to feel like they're paying the right value. Obviously, a lot of cars will come through you mm. and, and you know, your experience, you obviously have a, a huge showroom here. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of cars being bought and sold elsewhere as yes. well. Um, how do you keep abreast of what else is going on in the market as well? Because, of course, that's going to have an impact. So it's not just you knowing the history of this yeah. car, how much you bought it for, you know, the particular mm. history of that car, mm. and then its particular value. You've Other cars. Got to, you've got to have a, a good picture of what's yeah, going on in the market. Uh, but, you know, I live and I breathe this business. I, I, I wake up at you know, 6.30 every single morning. And you watch I'm, your dad's uh, motivational uh, Monday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't actually. But, um, but uh, I, I wake up super early. Uh, well, that's actually not super early compared to a lot of people, but I'm in my office every single evening until 11.30 at night. Uh, and you know, if I don't know what's going on around the world in the car business, bearing in mind that my business, I don't know how much you know about it or not, but it is absolutely unique where there's lots of other great car dealers out there. There's lots of other, I wouldn't say lots actually, but there's a few other good car dealers. There's a few other good brokers, um, but nobody actually buys their inventory. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, we can walk around the showroom today and you'll see cars that range from um, pre-war cars to classic 1950s and 60s GT sports racing cars to um, modern supercars, which is, you know, very much our, our bread and butter, and then to Grand Prix cars. Mm -hmm. And all of those cars, you know, we, based on what little or a lot of knowledge that I might have and my gut feeling is that we will invest in our product, we will buy the cars for stock and then we will look at reselling them and nobody else anywhere in the world does that. Why? Uh, that seems like a very cash inefficient way of going about it unless of course you have a wonderful finance company behind you. But. Yeah, uh, all I've ever done actually, we don't work on any, fi sorry uh, Darren, but we don't work on any, any um, finance. Uh, I've always wanted to go to sleep of a evening time it was the way I was brought up but I always wanted to go to sleep knowing that whatever happens in the world you know I'm not ever going to be an, under any pressure mm -hmm. so all I've ever done all of my life is just reinvest my profits from my business and just suddenly bought more and more stock and more and more stock um, and why do I do it I like to be you know it's hard enough to satisfy one party in a transaction but when you're if you take a car on consignment or a brokerage and you're satisfying the seller you're satisfying the buyer and you're trying to make a profit yeah. and then on a lot of occasions the way we do so many deals is that we'll take part exchanges in you know somebody will buy a car for five million pounds and they might want to consolidate and say actually you know I've got Tom I've got a modern LaFerrari that I don't like anymore I don't want these hybrid technology around me or I've got a pre-war Bentley and I've never really used that anymore and will you take both those cars in part exchange and I'll give you some some cash um, you know that happens often and if you don't own the car it's much harder yeah. to be that flexible to do the deal and as you're saying as well I mean looking around the showroom I mean there is a pretty broad spectrum of cars here you, there's no single specialty or mark specialty or age Ferrari I would say we Ferrari for us is our um, preferred brand and we probably do better with Ferrari than any other brand. Mm -hmm. If you actually look around, you probably will see more Ferraris than anything else. But I was just looking at the pre-war Bentley. Pre-war Bentley. It was my, and then you've got yeah. the Grand Prix cars over there and you've got There's a bunch a of Porsches. Yeah, there is. Well, my point is, I mean, it's quite yeah. a... Diverse. It, yes, very diverse. So What's your favourite? They may be diverse, but there is a commonality, I think, in what you have in, it, in that you look for the best. The best of the in time. Class. We, the best and yep. best of whatever the example is. Is that fair No to excuse say? cars. Yep. We don't get involved. Never had a replica through the door. We have clients um, call us up all the time and say, hey, I don't even want you to buy it, Tom. Will you just sell it for me? You can charge a 10% commission or how much commission do you want? And I never want my brand to be associated with selling replicas. I don't believe in replicas, don't like them, don't want them around here. Um, and, you know, we like cars that are either super original or perfectly restored. 
So we don't really like, we don't like... You're a purist. Yeah, we, yeah. we uh, you know, I don't like to get involved in cars that have too many excuses. You know, it's lost its original engine. Okay, it's had a lot of the chassis replaced and the body once was original three bodies ago. Like those cars, at that point, it's just phone down, let's concentrate on something else. I've seen else. cars where you're literally down to a chassis plate and yeah, it's yeah. basically a reconstruction exactly. in, in yeah. its entirety and then passed off like as the original handle. car. Well, it's I mean, a bit like Trigger's broom, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's had four new heads. Yeah. And <laughs> I've never understood that, market. It's yeah. always like, okay, so it's got a chassis plate, that was really, but the rest is a reconstruction. So what is your favourite? I like 1950s and 60s Ferraris. So for me, a Ferrari 275 is a car that we, a model that we um, know probably better than most. It's a car that, you know, we, I counted up the other day and I think we've had now 47 different 275s in the last uh, 12 years. So mm-hmm. some of those cars we've sold three and four times. Yeah. Um, so that's quite a lot that of is. transactions. Um, 250 Ferraris, you know, 1950s. I, I love the sports racing era. A Jaguar XKSS Lovely. is like the greatest car ever. But that's ever. a Jag and you're talking about I know, Ferraris. that's a Ferrari, yeah, that's a, that's a, that, <laughs> But that, it is, it's that got is that special. kind of stylish. Steve, it has the Steve, Steve McQueen, McQueen <laughs> effect. Um, but, uh, you know, if that had a Ferrari badge on the front, it'd be $100 million without a shadow of a doubt. Why? Oh, oh gosh, okay, I'm curious, why? Well, Ferraris attract such a premium um, they are the litmus paper of the classic car world. You know, a classic Ferrari will appeal to, you know, we sell them to um, very young collectors who basically want the latest and greatest Ferrari supercar. Mm-hmm. And it will appeal to them to feel that they have a serious collection of Ferraris and it will help them with their stance with Ferrari in trying to achieve, uh, in trying to obtain one of the next new generation. And then we'll sell um, some great Ferraris to the old school hierarchy collector. It, it, they appeal to absolutely anybody that collects cars. Even when you're, you know, you can be driving, a, you can be driving around in a 275 or a 250 and, you know, you are an extremely knowledgeable um, lady when it comes to cars you know you know more than most other people anyway full stop okay. but you you know you might pass um ladies in the street who know nothing no, at yeah. all about cars but they'll know what it is and they appreciate it yeah you know they'll look at it and say that they'll come up and say that is a beautiful car you know what is this what 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 year is it and what model is it and um you know it's a different ferrari's appeal to the world it, it's That's, one of the strongest yeah. it's the strongest brand yeah it's the strongest car brand now, obviously, you started, as you mentioned at the beginning, working with your dad mm-hmm. and this being very much a family business. What prompted you, what inspired you to branch off and set up on your own? Because, of course, the family business is still with your dad and your younger brother. My dad and my brother and, uh, you know, a very, still a very successful business. What, what prompted me? What prompted me was uh, several things, really. Uh, number one, for about the last... 15 years, I, the business, um, my father's business always focused on uh, nearly new luxury and performance cars. And, uh, you know, I focused for the last, say, 15, for the last 15 years, from about 2007 onwards, on very collectible cars. And I found that we were getting to a stage around about, I remember it happening on one particular car, actually. We bought a, um, a 250 short wheelbase from New York um, and uh, I can't remember the chassis number now, but it will come to me. And anyway, we bought this, we bought this car from New York, um, from a doctor actually. And if you went on our website, we saw like Porsche 911, you know, a mm-hmm. Ferrari um, 458, and you know the, the modern cars, yeah, a Rolls yeah. Royce, yeah, yeah. whatever it was, and then a Ferrari 250 short wheelbase. And the 250 short wheelbase at the time was about twelve and a half million dollars, and it just it just <clears throat> sat sit. out of yeah. place. And um, I felt that those were the cars that I wanted to, to focus my life on, dedicate my life to, and say the most collectible cars. You know, I grew up since I was eleven years old buying and selling 
you know, Range Rovers and Porsche 911s and whatever, whatever they were. And it's, it's a fantastic way to make a, you know, it, it, what a way to make a living, what a way to, um, what a way to live. But after so long, the cars just don't stimulate or didn't stimulate me the way if I go and buy a, a Daytona, like you just spoke mm -hmm. about um, before we went, before we, before we went live and you buy a Daytona and you read through the history file, 40 years of its life and where it's been, the people it's seen. And um, to me, that's so much more interesting yeah. than buying and selling the same value of car, but might be a modern car, you know, an SF90, for example, <clears throat> an SF90 or a Daytona. You know, for me, yeah, yeah. I'd get much more know, pleasure yeah, yeah. out of San and Daytona. So I felt like that that was number one, um, the cars that I wanted to focus on. And I wanted a business that was modeled around focusing in purely on those cars. And number two, you know, the way I operate my business is very different to everybody else. It's not just different to the way my father does business or the way my brother um, does business. You know, I do the way I operate my business is very different. And then if, if um, you know, if you have two partners in the business that basically mm -hmm. are working in a different direction, you, you take, you know, you, you take time to consider and go, well, where, what's going to happen in five years time or 10 years time? And then you just make a great big leap. I'm, I'm just musing <laughs> in my head as you're speaking about what family meal times and get togethers must be like whilst you're all yeah. having. <laughs> we, we don't we don't have that many. You know, um, my brother and I are still um, <clears throat> pretty close, uh, but, you know, we're all busy and, you know, we all have families. Um, so we don't, yeah. you know, we don't get together that often. Don't discuss. Oh, no, no. We, we don't get together you're that very often. very different, completely different businesses now for the reasons that you state so <clears throat> so i don't think there's any surprise um that you made that leap but you're obviously very confident to go and do that it's not still very i remember at the time it was still it, quite scary though. Yeah. I mean, as i'm saying is how much did you feel it was a leap for you or you know i felt like that it was inevitable yeah so if it didn't happen you know that year it might have happened in two years later or five years later there's never a good time no. And, you know, you just have to believe in yourself and, uh, you know, you, you have to just do what's right well, for you. Well, if it's in you, you, will, yeah. you just, well, you need to get on with it for yourself, don't you? And I had a very similar experience when I had a finance brokerage business and the partner were going very different directions and it was inevitable that you'd get to a point where I wanted to try and start building a finance company and do something different. Yeah. Um, and look so, how your business has, you know, blossomed. We're doing okay, yeah, yeah. I think. No, it's fantastic. Yeah. I'd love to see the growth of it. It's been fantastic. But, you know, also, I, I would say that um, I owe my father a huge amount of credit, not necessarily because what he taught me about cars, because my dad, you know, he isn't super knowledgeable on old cars, mm -hmm. um, which he'll be, I'm not criticising in any yeah. way, he'll be the first person to, 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 to probably tell you that. But the work ethic that he installed, instilled in me from being a very young age. You know, I left school when I was 11 years old and that farmer's son analogy, you know, you know, I, my dad's always been a super hard worker. And then also the ability to close deals. Yeah. And, you know, that's very hard to be able to teach anybody how to close a deal. And obviously I just, you know, I, I, that's evolved over the years. And I do that in a very different style today than what, say, my dad will do it in but you know he still taught me that from a very young age so although our businesses have nothing to do with each other and our businesses are completely different yeah um you know I, I owe him a huge amount of credit for the belief I remember when I was 16 years old on my birthday um my dad called me up and he said he was with my mum and he said do you know we've just been talking and from this day on, you don't ever ask me my opinion on the value of a car. So, you, so you're now at on that your own. Yeah, yeah, so on that point, so, he, he, so yeah. he, he instilled that independence from mm. being, you know, at, at that age, from 16 years old, I don't really do anything different today than what I did, what, no. than what I did that's then. That's nice as well. That displays a heavy level of confidence in you. Mm. So, well, 
hopefully it was, uh, it was went well okay. Founded. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, you're, as you said, you're hugely busy and mm. you work incredibly hard, but you found time to take part in a little bit of racing. Yes, um, following your footsteps. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. You inspired yeah, me. Did I? <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Darren, you, no, <laughs> none of the racing came from you. No. It all came from a man. Defin <laughs> Definitely not from me. Um, you were racing in the Janetta GT. I'm very Academy. glad you weren't in the series, by the way. Well, uh, listen, we Otherwise should Otherwise, it would have really together. shown me up. Well, no, okay, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, did you enjoy it? I loved it, actually. Yeah, Good. really loved it. I, uh, it was my first taste in race, racing. I find it hard to be able to get the time to go yeah. racing. It does require. You know, I've given up focus. golf basically, <gasps> and I, I love <gasps> what? Yeah. what? What an awful I can't sacrifice! It. But I, I love golf. You know, I've played golf all of my life, and uh, I don't ever play anymore. I've had to give it up, and yeah, it's just so hard because we operate in so many different markets internationally. That that's the reason why I stay in my office until super mm -hmm. late at night. You know, today, for example, I, I saw an email and. Um, a, a guy said, can you call me at 10 o'clock um, Pacific time? So, you know, eight hours uh, uh, and you, you'll get, mm. you know, you'll, you'll get requests like that all of the time. So for th those reasons, it's hard to be able to go, I'm going to go and take a day off and yeah, go and play golf or go racing. And with racing, you know, you need so much seat time yeah. to you know, to be any good at it. So does that answer my next question? That's not is, very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, no, you can all, it's one season, cut yourself some slack. One you season. do need the time and yeah. that comes over time. Yeah. Are you going to do more? I've, uh, I was going to do the Porsche Cup this year and then uh, I decided to do another season in Janetta. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to Janetta for another year. It's, it's a really good series, actually. Mm -hmm. They're good people. Uh, Lawrence, Jamie, um, Steph, re oh, there's a real family there yeah. and they do, they do a great job and they do a great job for juniors actually, not that I'm a junior and I couldn't get into that series, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, they've done so much for um, yeah. young, young talent. Young yeah. talent. It's hard. It's really hard for young people to find a way into motorsport these yeah. days. So yeah, that series has been excellent. What, what do you like on a go-kart? Go kart. Yeah, um, that's about my standard. Do you know? You say it's about your standard. A a, a, a client of mine uh, contacted me a couple of weeks ago, and he said, "Tom, um, I can't remember the name of the circuit. It's a great karting track just north of Northampton. Um, oh, what's it called? And uh, not the Milton Keynes one. No. Team sport, no. Uh, and anyway, these carts are." Uh, 75 miles an hour. Oh my gosh, yeah. okay, not my standard at all. And uh, quite a bumpy circuit, yeah. and I didn't wear, I didn't realise that you're supposed to wear a rib protector mm. on cars. Oh, it hurts. Anyway, I actually, I think I fractured, I, I mean for weeks my ribs have been in a yeah. terrible state, so I'm not actually looking forward, Darren, to go any, anywhere near a cart <laughs> again. I'm going to stick to the Janetta. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. a bit cosier. Right, we're doing a thing called Race, Drive and Collect. Pretty obvious, I think. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask you, what's your favourite car to race? I mean, obviously you've only raced one, so. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been around the circuit in some really cool things. Like I've had a McLaren F1 around the circuit. Um, you know, I, I've taken some of my um, Grand Prix cars around the circuit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Oh. Wow. So I'd probably say a Formula One car. Yeah. If you've ever driven a Formula yeah. One car around the circuit, it'd be very then it'd be hard. Sorry, Janetta, but to ever go, oh no, I like no, my Janetta well, best. But. It was when you asked me what my favourite car to race yeah. was. I mean, the answer is always a prototype because yeah. it is the best that a car. Have can. you ever um, been in a Formula One car? No, but that's huh? what I mean because I've never driven a Formula yeah. One car. I, but I, well, I'll I tell you what, to fit into it. No. So. Next time I take my Williams out, you can have a go in it. Do you promise? I promise. It's a deal. That's on, that's on camera. That's, on that's camera. recorded. You can come and you okay, can, you that's can have a promise. Go. We're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, a Formula One car right, yeah. is an amazing sensation. Uh, you know, the acceleration, the braking, everything is so dramatic. You know, everything is to the extreme. I'm still excited. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, a Formula One car for me, I, I would probably say one of my Williams. Yeah. That would be my favourite car to, uh, to take around the racetrack. I'm looking forward to seeing them in a little bit. Okay, uh, favourite car to drive on the road? Ooh, as a daily smoker? Yes, or as a start with that. Daily smoker, I've got an Audi Very RS6. PC to call it a daily smoker. Sorry, sorry, a daily user. Um, I w I've got an Should Audi. Should we talk about electric cars <laughs> at all? No, I don't, I don't like electric cars, but um, <laughs> Tesla is not something you're going to see here for a long time to come. <laughs> Audi RS6, that's mm -hmm. my... Um, 
daily smoker. <laughs> you were trying to sell me that, weren't you? Uh, no, I, no, 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 no. I just said that, that that's a perfect car for me. Yeah. You said you needed a big we car for your dogs. We need a car for the dogs. Yeah. Yeah, and we still haven't enough, resolved Funnily this. enough, an RS6 was what was mm. being suggested. That's a decent, decent shout. It is. I said they would need Velcro jackets, though, which... Well, to stop them flopping yeah, around. Yeah, that's true. Back. That's true. Um, OK, and then Collect. Collect would have to be Ferrari, you know, something like a, a, you know, the ultimate car to collect. Well, you're only allowed one car. No, you can have as many as you like. How, how much? Uh, oh, what's the budget? Oh, I don't know. Darren, how much will you lend? No, no, he doesn't take okay. five minutes. <laughs> what's the budget? How many, ca- how many cars are you allowed? Five. Okay. Five cars. Yes. Okay, let's, let's split it. Okay. Under five million, five to ten and over ten. Okay. I was going to do it in ages, but yeah. We'll okay, you can do it ages. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. How many cars under five million? <laughs> <laughs> Three. See, the problem is if all of our clients only bought one car, yes. we, our business, number one, wouldn't be very successful. Our turnover would be tiny. So we always try and promote Upsell. multiple mm. sales. Mm. Um, what, would I, what would I go? So I would have... Okay, you're starting out yeah. and you've got... What was the I've book? just sold my business. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. okay. I've just sold my business. And I sold it for a lot of money, by yeah, the way, okay. when you hear my shopping list, right? <laughs> so you'll never sell your business. You're, you, you, there's no chance. Uh, so I would, I would buy a two eight eight GTO. Mm-hmm. I would buy an McLaren F one. Mm-hmm. These are road ones, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Two eight eight GTO McLaren F one. I would buy a silver yeah. uh, McLaren F one. I would then buy a Ferrari 275 GTB4. Oh, yep. I would buy a California Spider. Okay. This is quite a shopping this list. This is a big shopping list. list. This is like the who's who you've list. You've done well. And, uh, yeah, I told, it was a I really good you. business. <laughs> wow, you sold it, it was, for billions. It was, it was um, yeah, I, I sold it to Silicon Valley. Okay. It was that. So anyway, uh, <laughs> and I would buy a Jaguar XKSS. Oh, right. I'd have to have a pre-war car and I'd have an Alpha 8C. Ah, I learned to drive in one of those. Do you like yeah. pre-war cars? I love pre-war cars. Really? Love them. And do you know, growing up, I knew nothing about a pre-war car, was never even near one. And uh, I remember a client once saying to me, he said, Tom, you'll, you, you know, you end up, you'll make your way older. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you'll, you'll get into the 70s cars and then you'll get into the 60s cars and then you'll get into the sports racing cars and then pre-war. And I was like, pre-war, they drive terrible. Yeah. But I've got a, a pre-war Bentley, a four and a half litre. And I l- probably enjoy driving that car more than any other car that I've got. Because it's like when you first learn to drive, you're 17 years old. You know, I learned to drive when I was a lot younger. But, w- w- you know, when you first learn to drive. Normal people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> normal people like We're me. We're not normal. 17. I think, you, how old were you? Five? Yeah. I, I, can't, I always <laughs> remember driving. But... Um, you, you you want to learn how to change gear. You know, your foot on the clutch yeah. and it's that sensation of, oh, I'm driving now and what do I do? Oh, there's the accelerator, there's the brake. And it's a little bit like that with a pre-war car. You've got a centre throttle. Yeah. You know, if you've never driven a car with centre throttle, it's quite intimidating. You've driven centre throttle well, cars. My dad taught me to drive in his Monza around Guildford. Yeah, that's pretty cool. At 17, I was not many people can boast terrified. that they learned to drive uh, an AC Monza. No. No, we didn't have any of those in Newcastle back in the eighties. <laughs> <80s. laughs> they had no wheels on. <laughs> no, they'd be stolen, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> no, that's uh, yeah, so that that would probably be you've got to have a, a little bit of a variety. Pre war modern supercars and then that those nineteen fifties. I'm actually a little bit excited about this topic because I've I, I don't know anything at all about pre-war cars and we do fund them um, but we you know I know nothing about them we'd have to go to a third party valuer and get someone else to look at it because we have no internal knowledge but I do I've I've always sat there not worried but always thought what's going to happen to all these pre-war cars are younger generations interested in them so it's really interesting to hear your excitement about it and I mean is there is there still a future in those cars do you feel the same about old master paintings do you think that Monet, yes, yes. Picasso... Do, I agree with you. So, yeah. you know, yeah. a, a Picasso will always be a Picasso. So, you know, the, the greatest pre-war cars will always be coveted by the, you know, any important collection in the world will, will have to include them because it's just 
part of the so, cycle so, of so motoring, your the evolution. So have is part well, of absolutely. It's, it's also, and just picking up on a point you made earlier about the type of thing you like, it's that exclusivity. Obviously, mm. when you're looking at pre-war, original, you know, really good histories, you're looking at a far fewer number than you are on 50s cars, on 80s cars. They've on, built less cars, but yeah. then if you look at the ones that still... Um, survive today in the cars that survive in their full matching number status or in their full originality, yeah. you're, you're minuscule. Yeah. Um, wow. Talking about restorations, mm -hmm. as we sort of are moving along in this conversation, um, you've just recently restored, um, you've, well, you've had a lot of big restoration projects, haven't you? I mean, we have about a dozen cars in restoration at any one time. Okay. So at the moment in Italy, we've got, you yep. know, we've got two Ferrari 275s, we've got a Miura, um, you know, we, we always have lots of cars in restoration. I Do love you enjoy restoration, it? Yeah. love it. Like, absolutely love it. Fin it. It's probably financially not that clever, um, not that clever of a deal when you procure a car, when you buy it, and then you decide to take two years of your life and spend half a million pounds or 400,000 pounds restoring it, and then you get to the end of it and go, right, okay, what profit's left yeah. in it? Um, but you know, we always seem somehow to somehow. I think you come yeah, out on the upside. We somehow make a profit, yeah. and uh, but, but you know, your, your money's tied up. Your money, yeah. your money is tied up for a long time. And you have to put a value on. We need it. some finance for that. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, Help the cash flow, yeah. Tom. You have to tell me how good those rates are. Um, That's an interesting question, though. But it, this sounds like a business line of passion and interest rather than potentially profit. So, uh, well, I mean, you always we have to protect our bottom line. So, yeah. you know, w w I will only I only want to buy a car if I think if I have the vision to be able to go that car, we are going to invest a couple of years and a lot of money in it. Yeah. And then what will it potentially be worth mm -hmm. when it's finished? Yeah. But, you know, that again, that takes a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, sure. a lot of contacts. You know, you can't just buy a car tomorrow and send it to one of the greatest restoration shops on the planet because these people are busy they have two and three and four year waiting lists um, but we've always got cars with them we've always got cars being restored and i absolutely know that i am a project man like i love seeing the transformation of project, anything yeah. i love to buy something and then invest into it and you know um add value okay so that becomes emotional input into the transaction. So when you get to the end and the restoration's finished, are you not thinking, I quite fancy keeping this for myself now? <laughs> I quite fancy keeping every single car that I, we've got I in knew stock. that was possibly yeah. coming. Every single I, car. I, I like, suspected that might yeah, be the case. I try and stay so disciplined where I yeah. say, if I buy a car personally, yeah. then it's just, you know, I don't ever sell any of my personal cars. Yeah. Um, but if I buy a car, if the business buys the car, if I buy the car through the business, then they're always for sale. They've got yeah. to be. Because if not, we'd just yeah. end up stop trading. Yeah. And going back to what I, we spoke about earlier, where my business is unique, is that we buy our inventory. Mm -hmm. If we started to keep all of our inventory, we'd run out of money very yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you're have to we wouldn't be able to buy right. anything else. Definitely um, need finance if we did that. <laughs> you recently had the opportunity to sell Toto Wolf's Ferrari collection. How did Toto's that... was last year, yeah. Yeah, how did that all come about? We sold Sebastian's as well last year, Sebastian oh. Vettel's. Um, not, by the way, a, a lot of people think that both of those um, gentlemen sold their full collections. You know, they These still just have. The overflow. Well, Toto <laughs> sold his, Toto decided that he wanted to sell his Ferraris. Mm -hmm. So we spoke about it for a while and, you know, I, I'm not quite sure that Mr. Mercedes Benz, which he is. Yes should really be seen driving a LaFerrari. No, um, yeah. And that's, that's where the decision was ultimately made. And yeah, it was fantastic that Toto basically put his trust in my business of everybody else that he knows in the world. And um, he chose that our business to handle the sale of his cars. And, it, you know, our business, we received a, uh, one of the most um, fantastic achievements so far of, of my business life was receiving a Queen's Award for our international trade a few years ago. And on Toto's cars, none of them came here. We, you know, we sold them all remote, remotely. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so Toto, based where he is uh, in mainland Europe, and his cars were in mainland Europe, but yet he chose a UK-based business to... Um, handle the sales for him. Was that the same like a long Sebastian. conversation? Was it, or had it been a conversation that had been 
going you, on over time, or uh, do was you know, it morning, uh, call uh, me at uh, seven o'clock? Uh, you know, Toto <laughs> is a very intelligent businessman, and uh, um, he, you know, he definitely would have taken the time to uh, to digest and to 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 make the right decision. Uh, I don't think he makes that many wrong decisions, mm -hmm. and uh, y you know, he w once we spoke about it. He was very happy and very committed that he wanted us to deal with yeah. the sale. But at the same time, I'm sure he gave it plenty of consideration yeah. before even contacting. And as a business, you're also diversifying, aren't you, into hospitality? Hospitality, oh, the pub. The pub, <laughs> yeah. The pub. I'm quite excited because it's down my way. Are you applying for the, for the job? Is Actually, I bar could. Lady. <laughs> we're looking for a really good manager. Landlord, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we bought, well, we're moving to the Cotswolds. So we, right. yeah, whereabouts? I'm just north of Oxford. Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, the, we're, we're moving to an area called Hook Norton. I know, I know exactly where Hook Norton is. <laughs> so yeah. Hook Norton, we There's are, a great brewery there. Yes, although I've never been, but like every single person that I mention Hook Norton to in the world tells me about the There's, brewery, okay. so the, that need, must be a type of beer that I haven't, yes. I haven't tried. <laughs> um, but we are building a, what I hope will be the destination to come and buy and sell the world's greatest cars. It's going to be a 50,000 square feet facility. And it's, uh, you know, it probably means that we're going to have no money forever because we just, when You're I keep looking at these into. construction costs, yeah. it's insane. Um, and then we've also, we're moving our family home down there. We've bought a farm nearby. And we what inspired this? Because this is quite a big consolidation and quite a big move. It's a very big move. It's something that uh, we were thinking of doing for several years. We like that part of the world. We think it'd be a great part of the world to... And there's lovely neighbours. Yeah, to live in. We've got actually our, um, our farm already. We've got everyone around us is just fantastic neighbours. We've got to know them, even though we haven't put a shovel in the ground yet. But we're completely, being the project man that I am, we're, we've completely flattened everything. And we are redeveloping the whole site. And then what happened is about three or four miles down the road, there was a pub that came up for sale, the Greedy Goose and uh, which is about a mile and a half away from Dalesford. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great part of the world. And, uh, you know, it's about three or four miles from the house and from the showroom. And we just thought that'd be a really good idea to buy the pub. I'm, it, I'm not <laughs> sure if it is a good idea, but we thought at the time it would be a good idea. And uh, I think it's, I just want it as a, it'll be a, a trophy. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I want it to be a very high-end gastro pub mm -hmm. and we'll be able to complement, the business will complement it and that may complement the business. You know, we'll have plenty of clients that come to visit us and go, yeah. oh, you know, for lunch, let's go to our yeah. pub. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for dinner, you know, let's go to our pub. This is going to get expensive. This is going to eat into all your profits if you just keep inviting people to our pub. Yeah, no, no, no. You've got to buy a certain amount of cars, actually. Oh, okay. in to order get free lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, There's it's, no it's, such thing as a no. freelance. <laughs> you, uh, no, you, you guys will be, uh, you can be our first guest though, so. God, this is brilliant. Okay, so we're getting a free lunch and I'm gonna have a go in here. You've done well today. Williams, I know. Yeah, but we've got bigger plans for both of you, so uh, don't worry. <laughs> we're gonna get the washing up gloves. Yeah, I'm drying your washing. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a family business. Mm. As you say, you know, you've learned from your father. Um, you're now running this. What about your children? What, what do you see happening My kids, in the future? Uh, you know, I would love, uh, you, you always hear people say that I just want my kids to be happy and I just want my kids to do it, whatever they want to do, which is obviously true. You know, I wouldn't want my kids because they'd never be any good at it. If they, if, if they didn't, if, if they, they didn't love and, it, yeah. if you don't love this business, you know, I see people come into this business all the time. And I, you know, I, I say to my own staff behind closed doors, I'll say they'll be an estate agent in two years. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they haven't got the car business inside of them. Um, they're not built for the car business. And, you know, I would love my kids, my daughter, who, um, you know, she's fantastic with people. She's super intelligent. I'd love her to somehow come into the business. Um, my sons, you know, they're the farmer's sons. I, I hope that one day that they grow up and they come into the car business. I, I find the only thing that is difficult is that they, they can, it can be so easy to get blasé about the cars. Yeah. You know, my, my oldest son, for example, he, he was yes. a couple of years ago, he was watching the film Rush 
and he yeah. kept watching every night Rush and he just loved it. And, um, and I thought this is really good, like it gets him into the cars, but he didn't realise that every single day he walks past Nicky Lauder's Ferrari 312T, <laughs> the championship yeah. winning six time winner. And we had at that time, we owned the James Hunt 1976 championship winner. You do become very acclimatised if you're just around it the whole time. Yeah, and you've got to get... very normal. You have to become... You have to be stimulated by these cars. You know, I'm stimulated by that McLaren P1 mm. because I think, oh, well, that's a one-owner car. It's UK supplied. It's got loads of MSO options. And yeah. I love that car. And then I can switch very easily. And I love the Nicky Lauda 312 or the... You know, this, this is unique, this car behind us. This is known as the Cafe Racer. It's the only one, um, which is a PF Series 1 Cabriolet, but was built new for um, a Belgian racing driver, a uh, 13-time Le Mans entrant. Wow. And this car is, you know, again, so is, uh, my yeah. kids, I want them, I want them to be involved, but I also somehow, they need to always be stimulated by the business. But I guess actually now, just thinking back, I mean, where you started, it was with, so, and I don't mean to be disparaging about any of it because it's still lovely, but you know, Range Rovers and Porsche. Yeah, I mean, it, more it mainstream. was all stream. Yeah, it, it 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 was nearly new as opposed to modern luxury cars. Yeah, but it's yeah. Ma it's mainstream rather than this sort of level. So, um, you know, you've you've developed and learnt through the years that you've been involved. Obviously, as you say, it's hard that. You, it's hard to keep your children not being blasé because they're already coming in at the top, if you like. It is, but we, we you know, I'm doing my best. And if, if, if at the end of the day, my kids don't want to come into the car business, then I do ultimately want them to be happy. Yeah. Because they'll never be any good in the car business if they don't love it anyway. Sure. Um, and we just have to... You know, we have to do the best we can to try and make sure they don't become blasé. Isn't that true about any, any yeah. career path? You've got to be, and I say that to, our, to all of our own staff and to young people, is you've got to find something you're absolutely passionate about and obsessed about and just wake up every day wanting, raring to go. And you know, if you don't have that drive... Well, if you love it, then you'll, you'll never do a day's work again. Yeah, no. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so if you uh, love and I think it's doing. a blessing if you can find that. So. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to having a good look around the showroom now. Yeah, well, we but should be there, we think, at the end of 2023. Excellent. So. Well. In the opening party, you can both come. Look at this, you've got a free meal, you get to the opening party, and you somehow get to drive the Formula One car. I've never been offered so many freebies from a Hartley ever. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much. Thank it's you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, I thank, hope you, for, thank you for having me. I hope you've enjoyed it, and you can join us next time. We'll see you then. Oh,